Hey guys, RPG Rider here. I thought I'd do something a little different today uh, because it's raining outdoors and rain and sport bikes don't really mix very well. You can ride in the rain. Uh, you know, you just have to watch yourself um, in terms of how you ride. But not only that, the dirt that uh, and the mud that comes up, the wet mud when you're riding, you know, a lot of people think you could go out and uh, in the rain and it would clean off your bike. It's actually the opposite. When you ride in the rain, everything sticks to the bike. All of the mud that flicks up from your wheels, flicks onto the chain, flicks onto the bike, and then it dries like cement, right? It's just, it's horrible. Having to, then you have to rewash your bike, redo the chain, blah, 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 blah. So I typically don't ride in the rain uh, if I don't have to. But that said, um, you know, this is a sport bike related channel. That's what I am, RPG rider, not RPG sitter. Uh, so I've got to have a sport bike. <clears throat> so here we are. Vroom, vroom. So there we are. Sport bike. Okay, so I'll put that on the side, but it's got to be here. Because I'm RPG Rider. Uh, okay, so I thought I'd take a look at uh, Castles and Crusades and tell you guys a little bit about it because this is my favorite system of all time for fantasy. Um, so, you know, it's kind of old school-ish, but with some new innovations that I think make it superior to a lot of fantasy role-playing games uh, out there. Now, I've chosen a few books to show you. I have a lot of Castles and Crusades stuff, and I have a lot of printings uh, they're usually referred to as printings and not editions of the player's guide and the monsters and treasure um which are the two core books um because uh you know there's there's not a lot of change between them a lot of times it's the look and they might add a class here and there right so what is castles and crusades how does it work okay well it's by troll lord games uh and uh steve and davis chanel and uh uh, Robert Doyle. There, there are a few people uh, involved in this company, uh, Troll Lord Games, and I think they started producing for D20, and they produced uh, the uh, aired, uh, I believe it was, World of Aired setting for D20. And anyway, they came out with their own uh, system. So here's how, here's how it works. Here's Castles and Crusades. Okay, so if we take a look uh, inside, so... Taking a look, it's really nice, uh, as I mentioned, glossy pages, and you've got some core classes. Uh, just So uh, what I'd like you to think about is AD&D, or D&D 2nd Edition, or D&D 3rd ed Edition, when you're thinking about Castles and Crusades, and maybe a little bit of expert and basic thrown in, right? So you've got your six attributes. You probably can't see it, but you do. Strength, Dex, Con, Intelligence, Wisdom, Charisma. Nothing new there, right? And then you've got a bunch of classes that they offer. Fighters, Rangers, Rogues, Assassins, Barbarians, Monks, Wizards, Illusionists, Clerics, Druids, Knights, Paladins, and Bards, right? And so you roll up your attributes, 3d6, standard. You know, some people do 4d6, drop the lowest. There are a lot of different ways to do it, but the, the book typically just says, okay, 3d6 for the most part, for basic castles and crusades. Then you add your attribute modifiers. So if your strength is, let's say, 16, you get a plus 2 on strength-related stuff. That's basically what that means, right? <clears throat> so, and you, it's a leveled system as well. So once you get so much experience from treasure and from, um, you know, battling whatever, kobolds in the ruins of what have you, you get enough experience and you start going up through the levels, right? And then your hit dice, that's how many hit points you have for people who aren't familiar with this type of game. Uh, in Castles and Crusades, CNC, people say for short. If you have a D10 for your hit dice, uh, in other words, at first level you roll a d10, that's how many hit points you have, right? And people have to take away your hit points before your character expires or dies or goes unconscious or whatever, right? And then you have a bth, which is your base to hit. So at first level, if you're a fighter, you roll a d20 to hit something and you add one. Second level, you add two. But you also add the appropriate attribute um, modifier as well so let's say if i'm going to cleave someone with an axe and i have a 16 strength that's plus two and i have a plus one bth that's plus three in total so aroma d20 
add three and try to reach the armor class or the armor rating basically of the uh, person I'm, I'm fighting against, right? And if I was using a bow, I wouldn't use my strength, I would use my dex, dexterity, which would be my accuracy, right? So this is all pretty standard stuff. And if you look at the weapon and equipment section uh, here, <clears throat> lots of different races too. Um, Oh, I should mention that human, dwarf, elf, gnome, half orc, half elf, and halfling. So once you get into the equipment section, it's all very, very standard stuff, right? <clears throat> you know, if you use a spear, it does a d6 damage. If you hit someone with a Beck to Corbin, it's a d10, a bill hook, 2d4, uh, tall war, 1d6, what have you, right? So that's the damage system as well, right? So now, for those of you not familiar with it, if you have um, your armor class is determined by the armor you wear, right? So everybody starts with a base 10 armor class. That's if you're hanging out in your underwear and t-shirt or just your underwear. And if someone tries to hit you, they have to go over your armor class. So it's 10 modified by your dexterity, how maneuverable you are, right? So if I have a 16 dex, that's plus two. So now it's not 10, it's 12. That's an ascending armor class. So if I stick on a suit of leather though, <clears throat> a suit of leather armor, that's plus two. So that means my dexterity uh, plus my armor would be a plus four in total, plus two, plus two, added to the 10. So now my armor class is 14. That's what someone needs to get over a 20 sided die, right? <clears throat> now that's all standard stuff. Uh, Castles and Crusades is kind of has a brilliant system that uh, is so you've got all this old school stuff and it's all very iconic so um, you know you've got very um, you know the archetypal you know fighter cleric that sort of stuff right you know very class based but then you've got this cool system that they throw in it's called the siege mechanic I think it says on the back there you go siege engine so the siege mechanic is really what makes the game interesting and what I think makes it superior to a lot of games out there. Because a lot of games have loads of rules, piles of rules for handling everything, right? This, that, and the other thing. CNC has a really nifty system that can be applied to a lot of situations that takes care of a lot of rules, right? So in CNC, Castles and Crusades, they've got something called the siege engine. And here's how the siege engine works. If you want to do something in the game, right, uh, it can be covered through the siege engine, right? So I'll give you a couple of examples here. So let's say I was a uh, fighter and, um, well, okay, I'll, I'll speak to how it works. So essentially, when you try to accomplish something in the siege section, you go, siege system, you go against a, um, a difficulty. So the difficulty, let's say, is, uh, you know, it can be an arbitrary number, but the difficulty in CNC is uh, 12 or 18 that you have to roll over on a 20-sided uh, die. And what determines whether or not it's a 12 or an 18 you need to roll over um, is whether or not your ability is prime or not, not prime, non-prime. So essentially you look through your ability scores, you know, strength, dex, con, charisma, wisdom, intelligence, and you decide on character creation, which one's going to be prime. Prime basically means you have a strong aptitude in that area. You're just kind of born with that aptitude, right? You get, cause it's on, it doesn't change through your character's life. So you're born with an aptitude. So let's say if you decide to, um, <clears throat> there's a little tiny bit more to it. A tiny bit more to it is your class partially determines which prime you have. They, your class determines at least one of your primes. So if you choose fighter, here's a prime here you have to choose, and that's strength. If you chose uh, ranger, strength as well. If you chose assassin, your prime would be dexterity. That you have to choose but there's some wiggle room so if you're a demi-human you know dwarf elf halfling half orc that sort of stuff um your uh you get two primes so one from your class assassin then you put your other prime wherever i want my wisdom to be prime you know or uh, i'm pretty quick-witted um or i'm pretty uh pretty intelligent so i want my intelligent to be my other prime if you're a human you get three primes so that's kind of a nod to ad and d right in the sense that humans uh here demi-humans don't have level uh caps 
You can go to whatever level you want to as a demi-human. Uh, in AD&D, you did have a level cap as a demi-human. But here, the prime thing still makes humans a little edgier, you know, a little more adaptable, right? And that's why humans aren't, you know, all smashed out by the demi-human races, right? <clears throat> so essentially, you've got some primes, and that determines whether it's a 12 or an 18 you need, right? Because you just have an aptitude for that. So if you're going to lift something and you're a fighter, you have to have a strength uh, prime in this game. So your strength is prime, right? And that means you need to get over a 12 on a d20. But that's modified by the castle keeper, a.k.a. GM or DM, dungeon master, what have you. They determine, oh, you know, it's modified an extra two because it's a really heavy thing. So now if it's prime, you don't need just a 12, you need a 14. Or, oh, wow, it's modified by 6. You know, it's massive, right? So now you need an 18, modified by 7, a 19. You know, that sort of stuff. But if you're non-prime in something, it means that you're just not, you don't really have an aptitude for it. Right? So that means that, um, let's say, for example, you want to jump over something and dex isn't your prime. Well, you have to get over an 18 as a base, modified by the castle keeper. Right, so you've got this siege engine system. Now, uh, the other thing that's uh, cool as well is that um, for castles and crusades, generally anything you have class abilities too, right? Class abilities. So you've got your prime and non-prime for your attributes now you have class abilities and here's how they work so that this class this prime non-prime thing really handles a lot the siege engine handles a lot guys so you got all the things you need to do saving throws are thrown in there too so if you're, someone casts a spell on you and you need a wisdom saving throw, it's the same deal. You roll the d20, modified by the level of the caster as a difficulty, and if it's prime or non-prime, 12 or 18. There you go, for your wisdom, right? So it makes primes really important, right? How you pick things. And it also, you can't be Superman. You can't have one class that does everything, because you're always going to have... You're going to need a pretty balanced party in CNC overall, because if you don't have a prime in Charisma... No one has a prime in charisma, and then there are spells being thrown at you that requires charisma uh, saves. At a base 18 is going to be pretty difficult, unless you're higher level, right? Now, in CNC, they have another thing on the go. So they have this siege engines also applied to your abilities uh, as well, right? So let's say, for example, if um, I'll use ranger for an example. So let's say if you're a ranger, and uh, one of your abilities would be uh, survival. It's a wisdom-based ability. So whenever you use that survival, right, you're off in the wilderness, you need to build a lean-to or what have you, keep you safe from bears and stuff, what you would do is you would uh, make a wisdom check modified by what the CK thinks is proper, right? So if it just says, well, it's just a basic check, make a wisdom check. Okay, so I roll my die. If I chose wisdom as my prime, I'd have to roll over a 12. If I didn't choose Wisdom as my prime, I roll over an 18. But the cool thing is that the classes make a difference too. So you also, if you're making a siege check, you also add your level to checks. What level you are. You add it to that d20 roll, right? So if I'm an 8th level ranger and I'm trying to survive, not only do I make that base 12 or base 18 check, I add my level. So if I'm a 7th level ranger, I add plus 7 to the d20 roll 